Hello everyone, this is Andrea, Marketing Specialist from Genes Group. Today's topic for the webinar session is CRISPR genome editing and its applications. And I'm very excited to introduce you the presenter today, Dr. Edward Wang. He's a field application scientist in Genes Group. He completed his PhD degree from University of Adelaide. He worked as a post a uh, postdoctoral fellow at National Cancer Center Singapore for three years. During his time in NCC, he had successfully reported the predictive factors for genetic screening of BRAC, BRAC, uh, BRAC1 and BRAC2. He also reported the importance of genetic testing for 25 breast cancer predisposition genes using NGS technology. Most of his work were reported in PLOS1 and MPGA genomic medicine this webinar will take around 45 minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to type in the question field that you see on your screen and we're answering them after the presentation. If we didn't get to answer your questions during the Q&A session, we'll be sure to take that and we'll email back to you. We'll record down this webinar and it will be available uh, on demand on our web webpage after today. Lastly, here's a list of upcoming webinars that we are rolling out on the following weeks. We are currently running a CRISPR promotion, which all the attendees can get free easy edit, SGRNA, and 20% off for Cas9 products. Promo code will be sent to you guys via email after the webinar. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Edward to start his presentation. Dr. Edward, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Andrea, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be invited and present to you the CRISPR technology that GenScript is offering. Uh, over the last 10 years, the genome editing technology has been developed at a fast pace, especially since the discovery of the CRISPR system. The maturations of this technology has been utilized in a wide application, ranging from the basic research to the applied biotechnology. So today, I'm here to share with you uh, how we could harness this technology for different applications and what GenScript could have offered in order to help our researchers in their study. So let me guide you through to the contents of my presentation today. Firstly, I will give a brief introduction about the CRISPR systems, followed by uh, the, talking about the RMP system and to show how this system could have helped to simplify it and accelerate the genome editing workflow. And then lastly, I'll be talking about some other extended products that are based on the CRISPR technology that GenScript is offering. Okay, let me put up the highlights. So in the mid 2000s, the researchers uh, discovered that a lot of the bacteria consist of this repeated sequence as shown in these black diamonds here that flank with the unique sequence as shown in the color boxes uh, in their genome. Uh, that can be called the CRISPR, uh, which is an acronym that stands for the Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. They found that this unique sequence comes from the DNAs that are found in the virus. And the scientists also uh, identified nearby a case, uh, the CRISPR-associated or the Cas gene. These cash genes were consistently found adjacent to the CRISPR loci and displayed the motifs characteristics of both helicases and the endonucleases. And the tracer RNA sequence was also found nearby the, the cash gene. So here is a simplified diagram to show how they are operated. And the CRISPR adaptive immune system is composed of two main phases, the immunizations and the immunity. Uh, in the immunization phase, uh, the Cas proteins uh, will form a complex which will recognize and cleave the viral DNA into pieces. And then uh, these uh, viral DNA pieces will then incorporate it into this uh, CRISPR loci to form a repeat and a spacer unit. So in immunity phase, following the, re uh, following the reinfections, the repeat and spacer uh, units are transcribed to form a CRISPR rna uh, precursor. And then this Cas uh, proteins will be guided by the tracer RNA to bind with the rna to form a rna tracer RNA-Cas complex. 
So this uh, complex is matured after the cleavage by the RNA three uh, polymerase. And then so this matured cell RNA will serve as a guide RNA that will recognize either the vi uh, viral RDNA or sometimes uh, it could be the viral uh, RNA and then triggers the cutting ability of the Cas protein to cleave the genetic materials uh, into pieces. So uh, this really is the step uh, where it allows this system could be harnessed as a gene editing technology. So through the study, the researchers found that uh, the Cas9 has the ability to recognize the double-stranded DNA, where at the positions in the DNA sequence can match with uh, the 20 nucleotides in the guiding RNA. Uh, there are several types of the Cas uh, endonucleases available, but uh, currently the Cas9 proteins uh, is the commonly used as a genome editing to date. And also uh, what I would like to highlight here is the guide RNA that I show here is a single format of the guide RNA that consists of the cell RNA, uh, which consists of the, uh, the desired sequence, and then a tracer RNA that are covalently bonded together. And this is important because it allows the researcher to make a single format of the guide RNA that consists of a desired sequence that can match to uh, the specific region at the DNA and to track the Cas9 to the site in the genome, and then trigger its uh, cutting ability to form a blunted double-stranded uh, double break. So uh, the double-stranded break can be repaired through two different pathways. Uh, A, the non-homologous end joining pathway or the homology-directed repair pathway. So in brief, when there is no donor DNA template, uh, the double-stranded breaks will be repaired through uh, the error-prone non-homologous end joining pathways that, uh, in which the random nucleotides around the breaks will be deleted. And then uh, that can cause the indels uh, that resulting in the frame shift and then lead to the knockout of the gene. So when there is a donor DNA template that flanked with a long homology arm at both sites at the DNA template uh, in the cell, what the cell will do is uh, first to incorporate this uh, DNA template into one strain of the DNA in the genome. And then the nucleotides in the meters will be repaired to, to, uh, to the other strain of the DNA in order to res uh, that results in the knocking event. So with the increased understanding to this system, it enables the researchers to have a better genetics and a genetic control, uh, epigenetic controls of the cells, and potentially to be used in a broad range of application from the basic research to biotechnology and medicine, such as uh, the alteration of the biological functions in the animal, uh, the introducing the variations uh, into the cell, or uh, to make a useful synthetic materials or in food industry, uh, the CRISPR can also be utilized in order to improve the crop's quality, such as uh, resistant to the pathogens or uh, to improve the metabolic pathway for fewer productions or gene surgery, as well as the drug development. So now I would like to discuss about the CRISPR delivery systems. So uh, the CRISPR delivered system can be discussed from two different perspectives, the cargo and the delivery vehicles. There are three different approaches of the CRISPR cargos uh, in the market. First, uh, the use of a DNA plasmid to encode the, the Cas9 proteins and a guide RNA. And uh, the use of the mRNA uh, for Cas9 translations alongside uh, a separate guide RNA. Now, the separate guide RNA uh, means uh, the use of a dual oligo format of the guide RNA that consists of a cell RNA and a tracer RNA separately. And third, the use of a Cas9 proteins with a guide RNA, which is known as the ribonucleoprotein complex, or we call it uh, RMP system. So um, I will be uh, discussing more detail about the RMP system in the later part of my talk. 
Right. Um, there are two different plasmid systems uh, that are currently available in the market. Uh, the use of a single plasmid system that enable us to encode uh, both the guide RNA and the Cas9 simultaneously, and the use of a dual oligo for a uh, dual plasmid system that to express uh, the guide RNA and the Cas9 separately. The advantages of using these two plasmid systems are easy to use and low cost. However, the studies have shown that the disadvantages of using the plasmid systems are less efficient and higher off-target rates. Um, additionally, compared between uh, the dual plasmid system and the single plasmid systems, uh, the use of the uh, dual plasmid systems have been shown to have a better editing efficiency in some of the cancer cell lines. So the second approach involves the use of uh, mRNA for Cas9 translations and a dual oligo format of the guide RNA. So the advantages of using this approach are DNA-free, and because uh, the use of uh, mRNA for Cas9 translations, so it skips the transcription step. And then uh, it's fast editing and degradations, minimum of target rates, and a high editing efficiency. But the drawbacks of this approach are uh, it, uh, it has a higher cost compared to the use of a plasmid system, and it may induce the immunogenicity in itself. cell. So the third approach involves the use of the RMP system in, that they include the use of a Cas9 proteins and a guide RNA. Now, the guide RNA can be either a single format of the guide RNA or a dual oligo format of the guide RNA. The advantages of using the RMP systems are DNA-free, and it bypasses transcription and translation due to the use of the uh, readily used uh, Cas9 protein. It's fastest editing actions and degradations, minimum of target rates, highest editing efficiency, and most importantly, the results have shown that the RMP system is less toxic. However, the only drawback of using the RMP system is it may be uh, costly compared to the previous two approaches. So the CRISPR and Cas9 can be delivered either the use of a non-viral based delivery method or a viral based delivery method. The non-viral based delivery method consists of uh, the chemical or the physical approach. So the chemical approach relies on the use of a lipid mediated transfections that involves the use of a cation lipid uh, that forms the liposomes between the negatively charged nucleic acid and the cation lipid. And the liposomes will merge uh, with the cell membrane and then releasing the content into the cytoplasm. Alternatively, uh, it could uh, relies on the use of a calcium phosphate transfections by mixing the DNA with the calcium phosphate and in order to form a condensed calcium phosphate DNA precipitate. The calcium phosphate helps to bind to the cell surface, allowing the entry of the DNA into the cell by endocytosis. Um, the physical approach relies the use of an electroporations method that involves the use of electric pulse to physically cause a temporary pause in the cell membrane to allow the DNA to get into the cell. So here I show you the advantages and disadvantages of uh, these approaches, but due to the time limitations, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. The viral-based delivery method include the use of lentivirus, adenovirus, and the AAV virus. The advantages of using the viral-based delivery methods are high transductions and editing efficiency. However, the drawbacks of using the viral-based del delivery methods are high off-target rates and the ability of, it, uh, of integrating its own virus genome into the host genome that has raised the concern. Additionally, uh, the use of the viral-based delivery method requires a viral packaging that can be a pain point uh, to uh, some of the laboratories that are not well equipped to handle the viral packaging. So uh, with the understanding of this uh, CRISPR system, now I would like to switch gear a little bit to talk about how we could use the RMP system in order to accelerate and simplify the genome editing workflow. Here I show you an article that published in uh, Genome Research by the Kim et al. from the Seoul University in the year of 2014, in which the author uh, investigated the use of the RMP system 
uh, in order to improve the efficiency and efficacy of the genome editing technology. So here are the results they adopted from the paper. So in this paper, they compared the editing efficiency of uh, using the, either the plasmid system or RMP system in a hard to transfect primary uh, human cell line. So uh, the RMP mediated mutations uh, were measured by the T7E1 assay. So the results show that the RMP system induced the indels at frequency at 23% at its maximum uh, compared to the 10% that was observed in the cell line that transfected using the plasmid system. Uh, this indicating that you know, the RMP system has a higher editing efficiency. When they look at the cell survivor, uh, the number of colonies with the RMP system, uh, which was shown in the red bar, was at least twofold higher compared to the number of colonies that was transfected using the plasmid system. Indicating that you know, the RMP delivery was less toxic. Uh, well, to investigate whether the RMP system can reduce uh, the off-target effects of the CRISPR system, the author selected uh, three different sites uh, uh, that were previously shown to induce uh, the off-target at the highest uh, frequencies in the human cell line and to compare with uh, the tra uh, plasmid transfections. So uh, just let me put up the spotlight here. So as you can, uh, as you can see from the result, it shows that the RMP systems were highly active and it induced the site-specific mutations at a frequency that ranged from uh, 76% uh, to 79%. And most importantly is the result shows that the uh, off-target rates were significantly reduced. So this is the one that uh, transfected with the RMP system. And this is uh, the result that showed that the cells were transfected with the plasmid system. So as you can see that uh, in those frequency, it was a, a lot. Uh, okay, it, it was a lot lower compared to uh, the the cells that was transfected with the plasmid system. The author had also conducted a time cost study to understand the kinetic of the RMP system by measuring uh, the indel frequency and the Western blot study. So the, start, uh, the results show that the RMP started to cleave the chromosomal DNA almost immediately after the delivery, and the mutation frequency reached a plateau just one day after the electrical operations. So in contrast, it took three days uh, to reach an equivalent level of the mutations when using the plasmid system. So the Western blot analysis showed that the Cas9 proteins was rapidly degraded in the cells, uh, at 24 uh, post-transfection, the Cas protein was barely detected, and in contrast, the Cas9 proteins was expressed from the plasmid for several days, leading to the accumulations of the off-target mutations. So in a nutshell, uh, the advantages of using the RMP systems are faster editing results, uh, readily degraded Cas9 proteins, <clears throat> and to have a less off-target cuts. Uh, also, another thing that I would like you guys to take note uh, is that, you know, this article, uh, this study was actually published in the year of 2014, in which uh, the technology to chemically synthesize a long nucleotide of the, SG, uh, the single format of the guide RNA, which we call it sgRNA, was not available. Therefore, uh, the sgRNA that used in this study was uh, produced through the in vitro transcriptions by the use of a T7 RNA polymerase, or we call it a IVT sgRNA. Well, a recent study by the same cohort have shown that the use of the IVT sgRNA has brought the cytotoxicity issue due to the presence of the 5' triphosphate moiety on the guide RNA. So uh, it was hypothesized that the presence of this 5' triphosphate uh, on, uh, on the guide RNA will be recognized by the cell as a non-self RNA, and hence it will lead to the induction of the type 1 interferons, uh, which in turn will activate the genes that encode the antiviral effector proteins, such as the DDX58 and, uh, and the OAS2. So to prove that, the author incubated uh, the CD4 plus cells with both uh, the sgRNA, that one consists of a 5' triphosphate 
another one that uh, the sgRNA has been treated with the SIP in order to remove the 5' triphosphate that resulting in consisting a hydroxyl group at 5' end uh, in the guide RNA. So the results demonstrated that the mRNA, uh, the mRNA level of the OAS and the DDX58, as well as the, inter, uh, the type 1 interference, was significantly increased in the cells that treated with the sgRNA without the 5' triphosphate. So all of these um, results show suggest that the use of a chemically synthesized sgRNA without the 5' triphosphate is important in order to uh, avoid uh, the inductions of the innate immune response. So um, alternatively, uh, in the past, when the technology to synthesize uh, the sgRNA was not available, uh, the gut RNA it can also be provided by the use of a dual oligo format of the guide RNA. They, uh, they, as I mentioned, now the dual oligo formats means that the cell RNA and the tracer RNA are separated. So these two strands need to be annealed together before it transfected into the cells. However, the studies have shown that these two strands may dissociate easily that could lead to uh, the poor stability of the CRISPR-Cas9 complex they were uh, even, uh, eventually resulting in a poor editing efficiency. But now, with our in-house technology, we are able to chemically synthesize a long nucleotide of the sgRNA that consists of both the cell RNA and the tracer RNA. So unlike the use of a dual oligo format, annealing is not necessary anymore, and therefore the CRISPR-Cas9 is more stable, resulting in a higher editing efficiency. So um, GenScript had also conducted an in-house uh, an internal comparison study to compare the editing efficiency between the sgRNA and the dual oligo format of the guide RNA. So here I show you the results. So uh, in this uh, study, both the sgRNA and the dual, uh, dual oligo uh, formats of the guide RNAs were modified at the first three five primes and the three primes end RNA residues in order to ensure the better stability. So uh, from this GELF image, you can see that at same concentration, um, the sgRNA could induce uh, the indels at a higher frequency at 82% compared to the use of the guide R R dual oligo format of the guide RNA at 64%. Additionally, uh, GenScript had also investigated whether or not the purification method could affect uh, the editing efficiency. So uh, in fact, the gel photo tells us that the sgRNA that purified using the HPLC method induced an uh, indel frequency at 76% uh, compared to the 66% um, with the uh, sgRNA that purified using the desorted uh, format. So in a summary, uh, our result shows that the sgRNA performs better than the dual oligo format of the guide RNA. And with a higher purity, it boosts the editing efficiency further. So this table basically summarizes of uh, the editing efficiency with the use of three different formats of the uh, guide RNA that I mentioned. So the IVT sgRNA requires uh, the in vitro transcriptions and the purification steps. However, the presence of the 5' triphosphate moiety in the guide RNA uh, may result in the induction of the innate immune response that could induce uh, the cytotoxicity in the cell. The chemically synthesized sgRNA is a readily used sgRNA and can be modified to make the molecule more stable in order to improve the editing efficiency. But the most important thing is the use of this sgRNA could reduce the immunogenicity and the cytotoxicity due to the absence of the 5' triphosphate. In contrast, the use of the dual oligo format requires a multiple steps to annealing uh, the cell RNA and the tracer RNA together. But as I mentioned in my previous slide, you know, uh, this, uh, the use of this dual oligo format of the guide RNA requires the, uh, the uh, annealings, and then uh, this would, uh, but you know, the annealings is not stable, and therefore the CRISPR complex uh, has a poor stability that resulting in a low editing efficiency. 
So here I show you how the RMP system could have simplified the traditional genome editing workflow by using the T cell as an example in a CRISPR uh, knockout. So basically what you need is to design a guide RNA of choice uh, and then to mix it with the Cas9 proteins for one hour in order to form the RMP complex. So while waiting, the T cells can be harvested and resuspended in the electrode operation buffer. So after one hour, the newly formed of the RMP system can then mix it with the cells in the electrode operation buffer and further uh, electrode for 30 minutes. This is then followed by the cells expansion in the 96 well plates for downstream analysis. So it's just as simple as that. So currently, uh, GenScript has two different of the sgRNA options for our clients to choose. Uh, the easy edit sgRNA and a safe edit sgRNA. So both of these sgRNA options could achieve the same uh, editing level. The only difference is the safe edit sgRNA has a higher purity in order to ensure the minimum cytotoxicity effect and to reduce uh, the off-target rates, especially for the experiments that require the use of the primary cells and the stem cell. So you may uh, access to this website that, uh, that show in the below of the uh, slide for more detailed information. So that is all uh, about the use of the RMP system for CRISPR knockout. So now let's move on to talk about the donor uh, DNA template choice for CRISPR knock-in. So traditionally, the viral vector delivery methods are used in order to deliver uh, the uh, donor DNA template into the specific site uh, in the cell. This is due to uh, uh, their high transductions and editing efficiency. However, as I mentioned, um, the disadvantages of using the viral-based uh, delivery methods are high off-target rates and its ability to integrate its own viral genome into the host genomes could lead to uh, the onset of other diseases and they could be a worry to uh, the scientists. Fortunately, thanks to the uh, advance in the, in the maturations of the CRISPR system. Uh, it is now possible to insert uh, large genes at a specific gene size uh, in the cell without the using of uh, viral vectors. And this leads to the potential use of the linear double-strand DNA or single-strand DNA as a donor DNA template. So here I show you a collaboration study between the GenScript and uh, Dr. Rove from Marsden Laboratory in the University of California in San Francisco uh, to investigate the feasibility of using the double-strand DNA or a single-strand DNA as a donor template. So in this study, uh, the author described that the use of the recombinant viral vectors to genetically reprogram the T cell for therapeutic purposes may be hampered due to uh, its high off-target rates. Additionally, the needs for the viral vectors has slowed down the research and clinical use as their manufacturing and testing is lengthy and expensive. And therefore, in this article, they describe the success in developing a CRISPR system uh, that does not require the viral vector. And this system allows the rapid and efficient insertions of the large DNA sequence at a specific site in the genomes of the primary human T cells while preserving the cell viability and function. So the picture on the right shows uh, demonstrate the concept of the study. So the objective was to insert the GFB tag that flanked with a long homology arm at both ends at end terminal of the housekeeping gene or, or the RAB, uh, RAB11A gene uh, without the use of the viral vectors in both the primary hu uh, human CD4 plus and the CD8 plus cell. So here is the approach employed by uh, the researchers. So similar to uh, the workflow that I mentioned earlier. So uh, in this approach, uh, what the, uh, the clients did was to design uh, the guide RNA and also the donor DNA template. So in here, uh, the author utilized the double strand donor DNA template. And then the guide, after the design, the guide RNA was then mixed with the Cas9 proteins for one hour. And then after one hour, uh, while waiting, uh, the T cell was isolated and resuspended in the uh, electrode pressure buffer. 
So just after one hour, the newly formed of the RNP systems was then uh, mix it with the donor DNA template for 10 to 30 seconds, and then uh, mix it with the, uh, the T cell in the electro pressure buffer and further electro for it for 30 minutes. So this uh, in the 96 well plates for downstream analysis. So here are the results that uh, adopted from the articles. Uh, with the use of the RMP with the double strand DNA donor template, the results show that a GFP expression uh, was achieved at about 50% uh, for both of the primary human CD4 plus and the CD8 plus T cells. The confirmed that the system could also be applied broadly by targeting the sequence in uh, different locations throughout the genome. So to do this, uh, they efficiently engineered the primary T cells by fusing the GFP with different genes, including the CD4, uh, the CLTA, ACTB, FBL, and uh, tuber one b And then the study shows a GFP expressions that ranging from 36% to 23% respectively. These results were then further validated by the use of a confocal microscopy to confirm the fusion protein localization, including the endosome, plasma membrane, clathrin, actin, uh, nucleolite and uh, microtubules. Nevertheless, uh, the further analysis had demonstrated that while the use of a double strand DNA is uh, highly specific and can achieve a high on target rate, the off target integrations was observed across the template that I mentioned earlier. And so this led to uh, the author. Uh, look at the use of the feasibility of using the single strand DNA donor template. So in this study, um, the double strand DNA donor template was used as a comparison. So the study showed that with the use of SSDNA could achieve a similar, if not better, uh, knocking efficiency as a double strand DNA template. And the efficiency increased with the increased amount of the template use. Additionally, the further analysis showed a higher cell viability with the use of a single strand DNA uh, donor template. And most importantly, uh, the off target rate was significantly reduced with the use of a single strand uh, donor, uh, DNA donor template uh, while maintaining uh, a high on target rate as uh, the uh, as, uh, same, as the, uh, same level as the double strand DNA donor template. So this table summarized the advantages and disadvantages of uh, different donor DNA template choice for CRISPR knocking. So as mentioned, uh, the viral vectors is, used, uh, is commonly used due to its high transduction efficiency, but uh, its high off-target uh, rate and uh, toxicity remains a concern. So uh, the study has shown the feasibility of using the linear double strain DNA or a single strand DNA as a donor uh, template without the use of the viral vector. But uh, the high off target rate and the toxicity with the use of double strand DNA donor templates remain to be resolved. So, uh, in contrast, um, the use of a single strand DNA donor template may seem to be beneficial due to its uh, low off target rate and uh, low toxicity. However, the productions of the SSDNA could be an issue. Now, the reason that I say that is because, you know, in the past, uh, the technology to chemically synthesize the SSDNA was not available. So the production of the SSDNA was, uh, was need to go through a complicated uh, pathway. For example, the use of um, the exonuclease in order to degrade one strain of the PCR product. There was labor as uh, with uh, five, uh, the phosphate group at the five prime end or to use uh, IVT-RT workflow that involve uh, the generation of uh, SSRNA uh, from the in vitro transcriptions and uh, followed by the reverse transcriptions in order to synthesize a cDNA. And then lastly, uh, to degrade the RNA by incubating with the sodium hydroxide. But now uh, with our in-house technology, GenScript has the uh, capability to help the researcher to uh, synthesize uh, the SSDNA with good quality. So in summary, uh, the RMP systems helps to accelerate and simplify the entire genome editing workflow. 
And then the chemically synthesized sgRNA can help to avoid the induction of innate response systems uh, due to the absence of the 5' triphosphate moiety. And the third, uh, the SSDNA as a donor DNA template may seem to be beneficial uh, due to its low toxicity and uh, low, uh, the low off target rate. Now, I would like to move on to talk about some other extended products uh, that based on the CRISPR technology that are offered by GenScript. That include uh, the guide RNA library and to use the CRISPR technology to create a knock-in or a knock-out cell line. So what are guide RNA libraries? The guide RNA libraries is actually a pool of a synthesized guide RNA molecule that can be used to mutate, activate, or repress every gene in the genome simultaneously. It is an ideal for large-scale screening or for knockout genes expression or transcriptionally activate the genes in the genome. It is an ideal alternative to shRNA-based screens, which is prone to off-targeting and false negatives. So with our in-house semiconductor-based technology, GenScript uh, managed to uh, synthesize a large pool of the guide RNA libraries uh, that is um, designed by uh, the researcher. So here I show you the workflow of how the guide RNA library is constructed. So first, the researcher will need to design uh, the guide RNA of choice um, using our bioinformatic methods. But in addition to these customized library options, uh, GenScript also have the pre-validated guide RNA libraries such as the genome-wide knockout library uh, for the human and the mouse genes. And then this followed by the guide RNA oligosynthesis using our in-house semiconductor-based oligosynthesis method. The quality of the guide RNA oligo will then be validated using NGS. And these oligos will then be cleaved and then cloned into the uh, lentiviral vector backbone that licensed from the Broad Institute followed by the guide RNA construct amplifications and purifications with a plasmid MIDI prep. So here I show you um, an example of the QC data of um, SGI, uh, the, sorry, the guide RNA library generated from our facility. In this study, the guide RNA library consists of more than 62,000 of the guide RNAs molecules that were synthesized and cloned into the lentiviral vector. So uh, the quality of the library was measured using the NGS. So as you can see from this table here, uh, the rank 10% indicated the guide RNA molecule that distributed on the left, uh, and then the rank 90% indicated uh, the guide RNA molecule that distributed on the right. So the ratio of the 90% to 10% was uh, taken. It is considered as equal distributions of a desired guide RNA within the library. Uh, as long as the number was uh, the ratio number was lesser than 10. Well, the smaller the, the number, uh, the better it is to ensure the maximum screening efficiency and identifications of a hit. Additionally, uh, our NGS data show 100% coverage of the total, uh, total oligo that was constructed. So after the generation of the guide RNA libraries, how you can use this uh, CRISPR library? So the studies have shown that the screening using the CRISPR technology is particularly advantageous due to its simplicity, specificity, and versatility. So once you receive an amplified uh, guide RNA library that are cloned into uh, the lentiviral vector, so what you can do is uh, to package a pool of the guide RNA express lentivirus in order to generate a library of the knockout cells. And by applying different treatments, uh, you may conduct either the positive and the negative selections. Each of these guide RNA will serve as a distinct uh, DNA barcode that can be used to count the number of cells carrying the guide RNA by using a high throughput uh, sequencing. So here I show you a classic study they conducted by uh, Shalems and her group. Uh, uh, these articles were published in uh, Science uh, in the year of 2014. So just a little bit of the background here. Uh, the PLX is a REF inhibitor to treat the melanoma. But some of the patients do not respond to this regimen because the cancer cell uh, gained a resistance by mutagenesis. 
So the objective of this project was through the gene target screening in order to identify the genes that are resistant to the BREF inhibition. So in this uh, study, the author utilized a pre-validated uh, genome-wide knockout library that consists of more than 64,000 of the guide RNA that target uh, more than 80,000 genes and were delivered using uh, the lentivirus vector. So uh, the gut RNA express lentivirus were transduced into the A375 cells and then uh, treated with the PLX for positive screening. The NGS data was carried out in order uh, to select the candidate genes that resist, uh, that are resistant to the BREF inhibition. So uh, as you can see from this result, uh, the picture on the left panel shows that um, the cell viability was significantly reduced after treatment with uh, the PLX for 14 days. And then the, uh, the genomes uh, from the uh, survived cells were extracted for NGS screening. So uh, the N uh, through the analysis, the NGS data show, uh, managed to identify the top candidate genes that resistant to the BREF inhibition. That include the NF1, the MET12, NF2, cow 3 TEDA2B, and the TEDA1. So now I would like to move on to talk about uh, to use the CRISPR technology to create the cell line. So here is a workflow that employed by Genscript for gene knockout or gene knocking in the cell line engineering. So uh, the entire workflow can be separated into five phases. The first phase involves the whole cell characterizations. Uh, and this is very important for the success uh, for the project. And depending on the project, the cell types involved, uh, and also the cell type involves, uh, the numerous tests uh, will be carried out in order to ensure and select uh, the cell that best fit for the project. And then the phase two involves the guide RNA design, uh, the guide RNA delivery system selection, and the guide RNA Cas9 synthesis. And this step can be done concurrently with the phase one. So this step, uh, the selections of an appropriate delivery system is critical for the success in a cell line engineering project. The phase three involves the transfections of the Cas9 guide RNA with or without the donor DNA template, uh, depending on the project, in order to create the CRISPR cell pool. Well, um, following to that, you know, um, Genscript will perform the enrichment of the transfected cells by several methods, such as the fact sorting, the antibiotic selections, or the drug selection. Uh, the numerous tests will be carried out in order to guarantee the success of the CRISPR process. And this phase is considered as a checkpoint in the cell pool. From the test, uh, there will be a standard guideline to follow in order to guarantee the generation of the modified cell line. And this is then followed by the single cell cloning, as well as uh, the validation using the Sanger sequencing, a qPCR, Western blot, or other functional assay depending on the project. Here I show you an internal case study that Genscript helped uh, the, our clients to create a um, gene knockout in a cell line. So the Keras genes encodes, uh, encodes for a protein called Keras, which is an important regulator for cell division. So in this study, the objective was to knock out the Keras locus in the HCT116 cells in the human colon cancer cell line by creating the indels in exon 4. So for delivery, the guide RNA and the Cas9 encoding components were packaged into the lentiviral vectors. And in the absence of the donor DNA template, the double-stranded break was repaired through the non-homologous and joining pathway to create an indel. To validate uh, the success of the introducing the indels into the site, but the primer pair that targeted the site where the double-stranded breaks occurred were designed for Sanger sequencing. So here I show you the Sanger data. Uh, in this study, individual clones uh, was Sanger sequenced in order to select for the homozygous knockout indels of the Keras at exon 4. So as you can see that 
the parented cells show a perfect sequence, whereby in the clones where the knockout was introduced, a missing sequence was found in the region. Additionally, the Sanger data showed that the homozygous mutations in the clones that could uh, possibly result in the loss of the Keras expression. So to prove that, the Western blot was conducted uh, in the selected clones to confirm the absence of the Keras expressions. Here, I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce you our ASA stable cell line generation service. So the, uh, the entire workflow is pretty similar to the CRISPR cell line generation. Similarly, you need to characterize the whole cells in the first phase. And then uh, in order to generate an ASA stable cell line, and depending on the project, you will need to synthesize the genes and then package into the virus particles for transfection. For a long-term expression, the gene script uses the lentivirus to deliver the gene. So we will then transfect the cell pool with lentivirus, followed by the generations of the single clone. Uh, different from the CRISPR cell line generation, uh, the validation methods of stable cell line use approaches like fax scan, Western blot, qPCR, luciferase for a customized project. So here I show you some of the typical results that are generated by GenScripts uh, from the, those validation assay that I mentioned earlier. So uh, what I would like to highlight here is, you know, a GenScript has a team of the experts to discuss with our clients for the success of the projects. And then a GenScript has a, a good successful record in generating the, the stable cell line. So currently, uh, our CRISPR Cas9 service is on a special offering with a free CRISPR guide RNA and a 20% off of the Cas9 enzymes. So you may access to this website for more detailed information. And also uh, for people who would like to understand more about the CRISPR RNP systems, there will be another webinar uh, given by uh, Dr. Chon from uh, GenScript on uh, uh, 7th of May, that is uh, tomorrow. Uh, so you may register yourself with uh, the link that I mentioned at the bottom of my slide. So lastly, I would like to put up this slide to emphasize the strength of uh, uh, CRISPR services that uh, offered by GenScript. And then I thank you for your attention and welcome for any of the questions. Thank you, Dr. Edward. So let's move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions, so we'll try to answer as much as possible. And if we could not get to your question during the Q&A session, we will make sure to take them down and uh, uh, answer them with a separate email afterwards. So the first question is, what's the ratio of SJRNA to Cas9 protein? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually depending on the project. So several rounds of the optimization is required. But uh, with what I understand from through the, uh, the paper that published by Kim et al, as I mentioned earlier in my slide, uh, the molar of the sgRNA should be assessed up to six-fold higher than the Cas9 protein in order to maximize the mutation frequency. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, it really depends on um, uh, the project. And then um, the, the, uh, I would advise the researchers yeah, to do their uh, in-house um, testing uh, uh, to get a better editing efficiency, with, uh, uh, to optimize the concentrations used uh, to maximize the editing uh, efficiency depending on the project. Thank you, Dr. Elwood. So the next question is, how can we reduce or avoid off-target effects? Uh, yeah, um, this is a very good question. So actually, uh, there are a lot of the articles uh, that are circulating around and it's uh, a lot of suggestions that are given by um, the different researchers. So uh, basically, um, there are a few factors that we need to consider. Uh, the first is the concentrations of the sgRNA and the Cas9. Uh, it can be uh, titrated to improve the ratio of the on-target to uh, the off-target mutation rates. But uh, the diluted systems also uh, reduce the on-target mutation frequency. So again, you know, um, the several rounds of the optimizations is required in order to get uh, the correct 
um, concentrations. And then uh, second is the use of the guide RNA with the addition of the two uh, G bases at the five prime end can possibly dis uh, discriminate, uh, discriminate the on target site from the off target sites according to uh, the Zhang Feng's lab uh, without sacrificing the on target activities in the animals and in the cell lines. Or um, the researcher can possibly uh, consider the use of a paired Cas9 nick case in order to generate the two adjacent single strand breaks on the opposite DNA strand. Well, um, again, you know, uh, the use of the Cas9 nick case will probably be uh, uh, a lot more difficult than the use of a wild type of the Cas9 uh, enzymes. And then uh, the other option is probably the use of the RMP in order to reduce the off-target effects. Uh, and lastly, uh, what I can think of uh, is possibly uh, the selections of the unique target sites uh, that don't have the um, homolog sequence uh, elsewhere. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Edward. So the next question is, based on Dr. Roy's paper, what's the maximum length of double strand DNA and single strand DNA can be used for uh, insertion? Uh, yes. Um, well, actually, I didn't elaborate uh, a lot in uh, about the articles uh, due to the time limitations. Um, in the uh, in the articles, um, the author actually have tried to use a larger double strand DNA template in uh, well, in many KBs. Uh, but uh, the researcher actually found that as it getting longer, uh, the efficiency actually uh, go down. So uh, unlike the use of the viral vector to deliver uh, the donor template. Uh, the efficiency will still be the same uh, well, you know, with the use of the viral vector will still be the same um, regardless of the, uh, the length. Um, however, uh, this is most likely due to uh, the mass issue. The amount, according to uh, the author, the amount of the DNA delivered into the cell is limited by the DNA mass. So uh, the efficiency of the integration is dependent on the molarity of the DNA. So the more copy of the DNA that uh, the higher the efficiency. So as you get larger and larger the template with the same amount of the mass, uh, you will have a you will end up with few less molarity. So you will see a decrease in uh, the efficiency. Thank you, Dr. Edward. Um, so the next question is: When designing oligos for cloning target sequences into a backbone that uses the human U6 promoter to drive expression. Is it necessary to add a G nucleotide to the start of target sequence? Um, yes, well, um, the U6 promoter is actually prefers uh, the G at the transcription start site to have a high expression. So um, according to uh, Zhang, the Zhang Feng laboratories, uh, by adding this G could help with the expressions though. Um, well, uh, it is possible that you know the plus fit uh, to still have to express without the G. But uh, if the spacer itself already have the G to begin, then uh, it does not need the extra G anymore. Thank you, Dr. Edward. Let's move on to maybe um, the next question. Uh, where are double strand breaks included? Is there are other PAMs in the region? Will they also be targeted? Uh, yes. Well, um, the Cas9 um, endonuclease uh, well, cuts about uh, three to four base pair upstream of the PAM sequence. Um, well, uh, there can be some of the off-target double-stranded breaks uh, using the wild-type uh, Cas9. So uh, the degree of the off-target effect depends on uh, the number of a, a number of factors, including uh, how closely uh, the homologous of the off-target sites are compared to the on-target site. Uh, the specific site sequences and uh, the concentration of the Cas9 and uh, the guide RNA. So these considerations only matter uh, if the PAM sequence is immediately adjacent to the nearly homologous target site. So uh, the mere presence of um, additional of the PAM sequence should not be sufficient to generate uh, the off-target double strand breaks. 
Thank you very much. Maybe let's try to answer one last question because we still have a lot of questions to go. What mm -hmm. other uh, um, questions separately after the webinar? Because the time. Mm -hmm. Um. So maybe the quest last question could be: Can this treatment can be any help for COVID nineteen immunogenicity? Immunogenicity. Uh, yes. Well, uh, actually, um. Well, as uh, as far as I know, uh, from the current, um, okay, sorry, uh, from my understanding, you know, uh, this uh, the CRISPR system has actually been used uh, to detect uh, the presence of the COVID nineteen. That is, uh, well, uh, as in you know, in the webinar that I presented just a few weeks ago, uh, there was uh, the Zhang Feng lab had uh, actually uh, come out with a um, technology called Sherlock technology that utilize the use of the CAS-13 in order to detect uh, the viral, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, yes, um, not only for the Sherlock technology, there's another group of the scientists actually um, comes up with uh, another technology uh, that is called HOMES, which is to utilize the CAS-12 endonuclease to, in order to detect uh, the DNA. So uh, well, we know that you know the SARS-CoV-2 virus is uh, uh, the RNA-based uh, virus. So in uh, to use uh, the Holmes technology, this viral RNA needs to be um, reverse transcribed into a cDNA before it can be used on uh, the uh, used with the Holmes technology. So whether or not uh, this uh, CRISPR can be used to treat for uh, the COVID-19, uh, it is still remain unknown. And as far as I know of, uh, I have never come across an article that used uh, the CRISPR for the uh, for the treatment. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edward. Due to the time constraint, we will end the Q&A session here. For those questions which we did, didn't get to answer just now, I will email the answers from Dr. Edward back to you. Thank you, Dr. Edward, for the presentation today and also to all of you who joined us today. I hope you find this session useful and beneficial. Thank you for joining us again and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.